so this would be an example of calculation of rotational inertia, which we usually use letter I. Sometimes it's also called the moment of inertia. Uh, rotational inertia of uh, uh, one D object. That's an example of an object like this, even though I'm drawing it with a kind of, even though I'm drawing this with a, something that looks like it has a vertical height. When you look at the calculation, I don't actually pay any attention to vertical height. It, the assumption is that it's thin enough vertically that the only dimension that matters is the horizontal direction. So it's a one dimensional object. I start by writing down, okay, the infinitesimal contribution to rotational inertia by an infinitesimal mass, dm, that uh, at some distance uh, x is given by the, the mass times the distance squared. That's the rotational inertia of a point mass whose derivation I did before this. So, and, and the rest of the derivation is, well, having with this, uh, expression for infinitesimal, a very small contribution to rotational inertia of this infinitesimal, very small mass, I add up all these infinitesimal pieces. And uh, let me just symbolically represent it as integral over the rod. <laughs> then, then you get the answer. The answer, oh, I think I have this memorized, is one third ml squared. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> now, what I want to demonstrate, um, at least a portion of it in the remaining seven minutes, is how to do a similar calculation for a higher dimensional object. For example, two-dimensional object, uh, like a disk. I think a disk is the simplest example I can do um, that's uh, uh, not quite so easy as the other one. <laughs> so, so let me... Um, let me sketch this out. So what I want to show you is the calculation of rotational inertia of a two-dimensional object. So here, what we are imagining is, imagine something like a, something like a disk. And we are going to say it's uh, so thin that whatever its thickness is, it's uh, negligible we can treat it as a basically a circle uh, or I guess a cylinder of a negligible height so that really the only thing that matters is um, is a circular base area thing. Let's say we'll say it's a um, um, uniform solid disk and when you are calculating rotational inertia, you have to start out with rotational inertia about what point. So the easiest point to use here would be the, the center of the disk. So now this is a question someone can ask. Um, as you try to rotate this about this center, uh, what is the rotational inertia of the disk? And um, if you're staring at it and um, not knowing quite what to do, um, or if uh, um, I, I guess you know, you could always do this uh, rotational inertia of a disk. And in, in fact, for a question like this, if you Google search like this, uh, Google search will take you to the answer. There's a whole, because it's a quite common setup, there's a whole list of moment of inertia that someone will have, a, or rotational inertia, someone will have drive for you. And you can look it up that way. And those are the easy questions where um, you can simply answer by Googling. Um, you are taking this class because you want to be able to answer questions where the answers are not so easy to Google. So let me do this from scratch without Googling. I mean, I Googled, but I didn't look up the answer <laughs> in the Wikipedia article that came up. So the approach we take here is the, um, it, it's the same for, if, or at a very high level view, it's the same for all the different situations. And that same approach is that 
this uh, entire piece is too big for us to handle. We don't have a, a general formula for rotational inertia of a extended body like this. What we do have and what we are able to handle is a small, tiny mass like that. If you imagine a small, tiny, infinitesimal amount of mass that's at some distance r, that we know how to handle. So we can start out with this statement that the, the infinitesimal amount of rotational inertia that's attributable to this portion of the mass, that infinitesimal rotational inertia, is given by the, the formula for the rotational inertia of a point mass. That is the mass times the distance squared. That's the formula that was derived again, um, using a point mass and uh, using something that we know about the torque and wanting to make a kinematics all come out right. So starting out with this, Conceptually, now what you do is simple. <laughs> you find all the other infinitesimal pieces like this, and you just uh, add it all up. And the procedure of adding it all up, you can describe it as an integral, as integral over the disk. Now, this is the schematic way to describe what we are going to do. But um, just looking at this, it doesn't tell you what to do. I mean, is this then mr squared? And that, that's not the answer. So what you, the hard work that you have to do is uh, coming up with some organizational scheme for how you are going to address each of these infinitesimal pieces. Uh, it often involves describing this uh, infinitesimal mass in terms of coordinate variables, so if you are thinking of coordinate variables, you could be using x and y. That's certainly doable. Now, um, in this particular setup, uh, Cartesian coordinate system will uh, make the problem harder. So I think if I, yeah, it, it makes the problem harder. Since I only have minute and a change, uh, let me make the problem simpler. Instead of working with the Cartesian coordinate system, let me lean into the natural symmetry of this setup and use the polar coordinate system. So I can describe uh, things as some um, um, distance r and uh, to address these different points at this distance r, I use angle theta. So r and theta are the coordinate variables that we'll use instead of x and y. And so if you imagine illustrating this infinitesimal piece as a representative piece um, that's addressable with the varying r and varying theta, then this is what you have. This uh, infinitesimal mass, it can be associated with an infinitesimal amount of area. Um, I guess just quickly writing it out, I could say um, the, um, the infinitesimal amount of mass would be some idea of density, mass per area, uh, times the amount of area. This will give me the, uh, the amount of infinitesimal mass in this small area. Once you are talking about area, then you can talk about length quantities. If you know the size of this side, and you, or you have an expression for these two sides, then you can say my area, which looks square-ish, is the, the side x times side y. Oh, those are some confusing variables. Let me rewrite them. So um, I think a y portion is easier. So because that's, uh, this is the change of the radius r, so I can label that with a dr, the infinitesimal interval, interval dr. So that will be my y of that infinitesimal area element. And this x is what takes a little bit more work um, I guess what I will say that um, that I can say in a 
a couple seconds. <laughs> That's um, this is an arc length of a circle of radius r. So this arc length should be the radius r times the infinitesimal change in angle d theta. So what I can write down is instead of this x, I have the, the radius r, uh, r to that point from the origin, times the infinitesimal amount of angle that this arc length covers, d theta. So this is the expression for area element. Now I can I finally have enough holes to write this out. So my the mass element would be the density, which I'll work out later, times this area element, um, that would be r d theta times dr. Times. And since I have another symbol that looks like this, let's just double check that they have the same meaning. They do. We are both referring to the distance from the origin. So I can write down this r squared again. And this uh, integral over the disk, now we can represent it in terms of the coordinate parameters. I can represent it in terms of theta and in terms of r. And don't know if this would be covered in math 3a or 3b. It would definitely be covered in math 3c, which we can't require in any way. So this is a double integral. I had to do an integral in terms of theta and in terms of r. And let me just quickly write out the double integral. It would be, um, so integral in terms of theta, it would go around one whole circle that covers all the points you can cover by varying theta. So it'll go from theta equals zero to two pi. Um, the other integral, second integral in terms of r, it'll go from r equals zero all the way out to r equals, um, I guess, big radius r. So r equals zero to r. And when you look at this uh, expression, assuming sigma is constant, which it is because it's a uniform solid disk, um, the integral should look simple. For example, look at the theta integral. Uh, nothing in your integrand actually depends on theta, which means um, the un which which means I guess I can do this. I can basically factor everything out of that theta integral. When I do, this is what I have: r going from zero to r sigma r dr r squared. So sigma r times r cubed times dr. All these are quantities that didn't depend on theta. I have this one thing that depends on theta. Let me write that out. Theta from zero, integral from zero to two pi of the theta. This is a super simple integral. The onto derivative there is just, uh, uh, so all this is is theta evaluated from zero to two pi and theta evaluated from zero to two pi is simply two pi minus zero, you know, evaluated at the upper limit minus the lower limit, so it's two pi. So this theta integral just ends up giving you a factor of two pi. So all this can just uh, replace that with times two pi. And uh, I now had to handle the, the R integral. So let me do that here. So the, uh, let me just factor out the things that don't depend on r. So I have two pi times sigma, and the r integral is from r equals zero to big R, and r cubed times dr. It's like any integral you see in math 3a. It's a polynomial, so the antiderivative is going to be r to the fourth power divided by four, um, do the derivative in your head to make sure that that's what it should be. To do this definite integral, you evaluate it from r equals zero to capital R. So uh, plugging this in, you get r to the fourth power over four minus zero to the fourth power over so zero. And uh, collecting all of this together, what answer you get is 2 pi 
times sigma times capital R to the fourth power over four. Now, if you look up your answer to the, you know, if you go to this Google search result and look up your answer, you will see that, oh, the, but the answer I see here, it doesn't look like what I derived there. You know, it says my rotation energy is that. My answer looks nothing like that. That's because we are not done yet. This uh, expression for the density, the amount of mass per area. So sigma is amount of mass per area. We have to write it out in terms of the quantities we have in the original setup. So let's say amount of mass, let's say the entire disk had mass m. Uh, the area of the disk would be the area of circle, pi r squared. So I need to plug this in for the density. So when I do, let me just write in m over pi r squared. That's where you see beautiful cancellations of the factor of pi that we did the one in the final expression. r squared cancels two factors of this, and this two cancels out one factor of two here, and all of this simplifies to one half times m times r squared. And that's the simplest example of two-dimensional objects, uh, rotational inertia. I mean, again, you could, because, you know, it's relatively the simpler case. You can look up the answer. Now, imagine situations where, um, imagine situations where um, maybe your cylinder is uniform. Maybe it's more dense near the edge, or maybe it's more dense near the center. In scenarios like that, uh, which could represent some real world scenario, those are the situations where there isn't a, a formula you can look up. It's up to you to drive the formula. And it, uh, at the very basic level, it's the same, um, same fundamental approach that we first figure out how to handle an infinitesimal piece of element. And once we have an expression for that, then, then it's a starting place for writing up the integral, <laughs> how we are going to add up those contributions from infinitesimal pieces and, um, and uh, get a full answer. And uh, as you go on your, in your engineering and physics education, it's, you know, the situations that you are expected to, to handle and can handle will get uh, more and more complex and interesting. And I, I will say this much that with the 2D object, because mainly because we don't require math 3C in any way, um, you don't have to be able to do this. You don't have to be able to calculate rotational inertia of a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional object by direct integration that I will not require in homework or elsewhere. What I do want you to know how to do is uh, calculation of rotation inertia of a one-dimensional object by direct integration. I think that's doable. Um, I'll have to think of uh, how I will, <laughs> so we don't have a midterm exams that we normally do where I would normally guarantee that I will have at least one question that does that. I'll need to figure out exactly what else I can do. But um, I think this is something that's useful for you to think about in this class. Because as you take physics 4b and maybe a little bit of physics 4c, um, uh, practicing this kind of uh, approach of setting up the integrals and doing the integral, uh, practicing this now will help you in future physics classes.